สวัสดีครับสวัสดีค่ะท่านผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่าน After the opening remarks, there will be a souvenirs exchange, followed by three sets of photos. The first set consists of the two co-chairs. The second set consists of the two co-chairs, the first row guests, the panelists, and the moderator for session one. The third set consists of the two co-chairs, the first row guests, the panelists, and the moderator for session two. จะเป็น our water management for climate resilient cities, resilient urban center and solar program in Thailand, ซึ่งเป็นโครงการความร่วมมือระหว่างสำนักงานนโยบายและแผนทรัพยากรธรรมชาติและสิ่งแวดล้อมกรุงเทพมหานครและหน่วยงาน water sensitive cities of Australia. After the second session, we will summarize the seminar and Q&A session, and the last session would be concluded by both co-chairs. ท่านผู้เกียรติทุกท่านนะครับเป็นการนำเรียนในส่วนของหัวข้อการเป็นการเสวนาในวันนี้นะครับซึ่งมีทั้งหัวข้อด้วยกันทั้งในช่วงเช้าและช่วงบ่ายครับในระหว่างนี้นะครับเดี๋ยวระหว่างรอท่านประธานทุกท่านนะครับรวมถึงระหว่างรอช่วงพิธีเปิดและผู้เกี่ยวข้องใดที่ยังไม่ได้รับประทานเบรกถ้าสามารถได้หนึ่งนะครับFor the first project, in so, would you like to give you give us the background of the first project? These three projects was initiated under MOU of Water Management signed by ONWR, Ministry and DFAT. On 17 September 2021, both Thai Atlan and Australia had several discussions before establishing three projects together. That's why we had the GSC meeting this morning to discuss about these three projects. And next, we will hear more comments on this. ท่านผู้มีเกียรติที่มาร่วมงานในวันนี้นะครับแต่ละท่านมาจากหน่วยงานไหนกันบ้างครับ And where do the participants come from? สำหรับฝ่ายไทยจะประกอบด้วยหน่วยงานจากกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่งแวดล้อมกระทรวงเกษตรและสิ่ง And experts from Australia. And of course, we got a viewer sent home from Facebook on today's seminar as well too. As of now, both co-chairs have arrived to the venue of today's seminar. Please, I would like to commence the official opening of the ceremony. To invite Dr. Sulasi Kitimonton, the Secretary of the Part O N W R, to deliver the opening speech on Thailand-Australia water dialogue, please. Excellency Ms. Julia Finney, Deputy Ambassador, Australian Embassy, Speaker from Thailand and Australia, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Thailand-Australia Water Dialogue today which aims to promote a collaborative commitment to sustainable water resource development and serve as a supporting mechanism for national and regional action to achieve the sustainable development goals through the sharing of knowledge from Thailand and Australia experts. First of all, I would like to thank the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and TESH for hosting this forum, as well as the Thai and Australian water agencies for their support of dialogue taking place today. 
since the signing of the MOU between the Office of uh, the National Water Resources and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and in 20, 2021 under the framework of this uh, partnership. This forum is one of the occasions of working together of both sides. The Office of the National Water Resources has invited relevant agencies to present and engage in knowledge sharing cooperation projects. Experience that have been conducted with the Australian side, it will be divided into two parts, which are the projects that are in operation and the project that will be start soon. This will significantly benefit the development of Thailand's water resources management through integrating and applying internal, international techniques and expertise. Distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Dow and fast situations in Thailand and allow the world are becoming increasingly severe as shown by news on TV, uh, newspaper and online media as a result of climate change affecting people livelihoods, as well as increased demand for water in all sectors, resulting in an imbalance of water availability and demand, which eventually impacts people's livelihoods and decreases the ecosystem and environment Showing this issue requires the expertise and experience of both uh, domestic and international experts. Due to being among the lowest average annual landfall less and among the gifted list of uh, evaporation on the surface of the earth, Australia is a continent with a relatively significant water shortage as a result, uh, there is a small amount of remaining water flowing into rivers and water source. However, Australia is a country that has kept up its development of uh, water resources management, which have uh, river basin management characteristics comparable to those of Thailand and effectively early warning system. Thus, the Office of uh, the National Water Resources as a policy agency that oversees the management of the country's water resources. Therefore, there was an interest with the Australian side in implementing the project. There are three projects in which Australia has expertise, which are FAO, Australia Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. Capacity building on dispute management for river basin committees and supporting early warning system and community communications project by representative from the ONWR and Australia will be presented in the next session for everyone to share their opinions and suggestions about the project. It serves as a venue for Thai and Australian experts to share their experience on the implementation of the ongoing cooperation project, namely the irrigation water requesting and sharing and irrigation project, reservoir water quality management project, representatives from the Royal Irrigation Department and Agassessa University collaborated with Australia on the water management for water sensitive and climate resilient city project, which was coordinated by the, of the Office of National Resource and Environmental Policy and Planning and the Bangkok Metropolitan for the plant plant administration. administration. This engagement in collaboration with the Australian side 
will be a significant opportunity for Thailand's water authority to serve as a diving force in the goals of the country's water resources management in order to make it more efficient in the future. The previously mentioned collaboration, collaboration program would not be achievable without the participation of all relevant sectors. Since cooperation in, is a crucial success element that must be enhanced at all levels. From, regulate, from regulatory agencies to business and civil sectors, I truly hope that today's event uh, will serve as a chance to enhance relationship and collaboration costs on sector for everyone's advantage and the benefits of relevant agencies in cooperatively exchanging knowledge that cover on dimension to overcome various obstacles and to be an important step towards achieving sustainable development goals. Finally, I would like to express gratitude to the Thai and Australian speakers Thai Australian Joint Committees, representatives from various agencies and all staff from ONWR who attend the event today. I urge you all to take advantage uh, of this opportunity to learn, exchange ideas and suggestions in this event. Thank you. Sawadee <laughs> Kap. Oh, thank you to the Executive Director of the ONWR. Next on the agenda, Ms. Julia Ping, Deputy Ambassador of the Australian Embassy to Thailand. On this occasion, I would like to invite Excellency Ms. Julia Ping, Deputy Ambassador of the Australian Embassy to Thailand, to deliver an opening remark for the Thailand-Australia Water Dialogues. Thank you, Dr. Surasi. Thank you, Dr. Surasi. Dr. Surasi, of the 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 Thailand Australia Strategic Partnership. This partnership comes in to do more together, including deepening cooperation on water-related challenges. In September 2021, our ambassador was pleased to sign the MOU on Water Resources Management Cooperation with the Office of the National Water Resources. Today, I'm delighted to join you at this important meeting to discuss our cooperation as both Australia and Thailand strive to enhance our water security, sustainably manage our water resources and strengthen our resilience to climate change. We congratulate Thailand on the many water-related sustainability initiatives, including recent water law and strategy reforms. We already have many examples of our practical partnerships between our countries on water cooperation. For example, Chula Lorncorn University and Griffith University have both made substantial contributions to the regional water security assessment framework. The Royal Irrigation Department is working with Australian irrigation experts on approaches to improve systems for sharing irrigation water. The Office of Natural Resources and Environment Policy and Planning and the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration are working with some of the best practitioners at Monash University to explore nature-based solutions to improve urban design. These are real examples of exchange and joint learning. On our side, we aim to cooperate more with Thailand. Today, we are hearing about some of these forward plans. I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Office of the National Water Resources and all governments, practitioner and academic representations here today for your part, past, present and future in our bilateral cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your kind remarks, and please remain on stage. 
for the Slovenia exchange session. Based on gender, please, uh, Dr. Kinsey, the co-chair, be on stage once again to uh, hand souvenir to our distinguished guest. Yes. Next on the agenda, uh, please, uh, all honorable guests, the front row, please rise up and have a group photo. Uh, there will be four sets of photo taken. First, that will be the co-shares. Uh, set number two are the honorable guests of the first row. So please come, come to the side. Next, uh, I'd like all of you to remain on the stage. Uh, I'd like to invite the panelists in session one and moderator on stage. Please. Session two will be uh, preceded session two, the photo session. This is the first photo taking moment of the co shares, the honorable guests, uh, seminar participants, and the moderator for section number for section one. Please march with the cameras. Thank you very much for some of our participants for section session one. As the co shares remain on the stage and the guests for the first first row to remain on the stage. Next on agenda for the moderator and participants to please come on stage to have a photo taking session. And the participants in the front row, please remain on stage. As of now, this is a historical moment of the co-shares and all of our guests, seminar attendants, and the moderator for session two. Uh, thank you, thank you, co-chairs, seminar attendees, moderator for session two. Next on agenda will be about the first session. Uh, during the in the meantime, I would like to mention about uh, the session one. We got uh, John Doe, lead water specialist, the representative of foreign affairs and trade from the Australian embassy. As of Thailand, as the moderator for session number one, moderated by John Dower. Uh, he's an expert and uh, took part in many government discussions at the bilateral and the regional discussions, and he has a, a long, intensive expertise about water management. 
for the first topic is on the topic that OWR approved with Australia. So we have three projects totally. First, FAO Australia Asia Pacific Waters Guard Study Program, uh, which is related to water allocation to solve the water scarcity problem. This it includes water accounting, and we will set up a regional platform to manage water. We are honored to have Australian uh, representative Miss Caroline Turner, the representative of FAO Asia uh, and the uh, public and policy uh, expert. And we have the Thai representative Kun Song Kiet Kam Tong acting the uh, River Basin Committee the uh, representative of the ONWR. He takes part in the water management, water allocation, and related measures. So this is a good opportunity to hear from both uh, both panelists. And for the... Yes, I want to talk about the dispute management for the uh, Basin Committee, which we related about uh, dispute mitigation and conclusion of any dispute when it comes to water management by the exchange of expertise and experience best practice of Australia and Thailand. On this topic, we uh, are honored by Carol Merrill, the South Australian Water Master, and she has expertise in about improvements of water, especially water management at the Merley Darling River Basin and uh, um, security of South Australia. And uh, the seminar from the Thai side is Zertan, the director of uh, water ma basin management of the ONWR, has an important role to play about to drive policy, uh, water resource management at the national level of both the um, river basins at the region, and of course mitigation uh, in the disputes at the Water Dispute Act of uh, 2000. The and the third project, the is. It is related to early warning system re related to water issue, and we are honored to have Dr. Jasarat Jayasuriya, international consultant on risk, uh, disaster, risk uh, ma disaster management. And for Thailand, we have Dr. Kun Tanaro Adwararat Prasad, the director of Hi uh, Hydro Informatic. Uh, center uh, because uh, he takes part in the uh, weather for forecast. And On this occasion, I would like to uh, the moderate for session one and all the panel members to let me have the floor to Dr. John Dor, the moderator for the session one, to the continue the session. Let's come up with any Hi, Dr. John, Dr. John Dor, the panel is yours. So, Sawadikap, good morning. We have all been introduced, so we won't go through that again, but we have the three topics. Okay. Three topics. <laughs> the first one, we're going to be focusing on water accounting as an important element of water sharing and allocation. And Carolyn and Kun Songkiet will be taking that forward. Carolyn, as you know, is with FAO. Uh, Kun Songkiet is an irrigation engineer, senior professional level at the ONWR. So um, we are also then going to move straight on to number two of the River Basin Committees. Carleen, um, building capacity for dispute management and perhaps building capacity to build cooperation. Uh, Carleen Maywald is a distinguished uh, water citizen of Australia, uh, a former minister, former chair of our National Water Commission, and currently the South Australian Water Ambassador and a respected member of the Australian Water Partnership. Mr. Lerdpan is the director of the River Basin Management Division at ONWR, and again, a very accomplished uh, Thai colleague, and thank you very much for joining us. The uh, third topic we'll be moving on is the early warning uh, systems and communications 
So uh, Mr. Tanaraj is well known to the, uh, the Thai crowd amongst us as the director, but from Australia, you may not know um, Dr. Dasara, Dr. Jaya. He's recently completed a very distinguished career with Australia's Bureau of Meteorology uh, in our national forecasting services, and now also a very warm uh, and welcome member of the AWP. So again, thank you all. Let us start with FAO's Carolyn and ONWR's uh, Mr. Sonkiet. Please share with the room our cooperation intentions. Um, good morning, everyone. No, my name is Caroline, and today I'm just going to talk briefly about our water scarcity program and what it means for Thailand and the work that we'll be doing with ONWR. Um, do I just go straight into my presentation? Yeah, go. yeah, okay, great. So over the past few years, FAO has been developing something called the Asia Pacific Water Scarcity Program. Now, what is the Water Scarcity Program? The Water Scarcity Program aims to address the reality of increasing water scarcity across the Asia Pacific region. I'll just let the slides catch up with me. <laughs> sound okay? Does it sound okay at the back? Thank you. Can I please have the next slide? So when we talk about water scarcity, what does that look like in Thailand? In Thailand, ex in Thailand, they experience all four types of water scarcity, too little water, too variable water, overutilization of water, and poor quality water. Each region of the country experiences water scarcity differently. For example, industrial development in the Eastern Economic Corridor has rapidly increased water demand and is causing, uh, causing the overutilization of water. There's poor water quality is widespread due to industrial and agricultural pollution and high population density, along with low rates of wastewater treatment, except of course in Bangkok. Thailand has also experienced recent droughts, which have led to an increase in saline intrusion, especially in the Chao Phraya. And climate change is likely to impact the country's agricultural sector due to increased spatial and seasonal variable variability of precipitation. Next slide, please. So what are we going to do about that? How are we going to address these concerns and what is our approach? At FAO, what we've been developing is after a, quite a few years of assessments, looking at what is really the missing mechanisms at the national level to make a future work where we can manage water scarcity better. And our answer definitely was looking at the institutional arrangements for water accounting and allocation and trying to build those capacities. So what does that approach look like? It's developing practical capacity in water accounting. It's developing water allocation frameworks and processes, working with farmers and water managers to adapt to water scarcity, and then making sure that in the Asia Pacific region, we're learning from each other's lessons. Next slide, please. So the question we asked ourselves, what is needed to implement effective water accounting and allocation, especially in a context like Thailand? And that is a thorough understanding of water tenure arrangements. It is a multidisciplinary space embedded in government that considers all water using sectors. It is an understanding of data capacities and shortcomings, a plan on how to build national capacities and address policy shortcomings, a complete picture of water users and their needs, as well as national priorities, and an opportunity to learn from best practices, which is where our partnership with Australia becomes so important. Australia has a long history of learning from trials and errors of trying to manage water scarcity, uh, water, water allocation, water, everything to do with water under conditions of water scarcity. So it's definitely going to be a fruitful collaboration that we're going to have between FAO Australia and FAO, hopefully learning from mistakes, lessons and successes. So what does this look like at the national level and what is the plan for the future? Essentially, the bedrock of this program is in the establishment of a multidisciplinary team within government, which is where we're so grateful for the cooperation we've received from ONWR, especially Mr. Lerpan's team, in working with us to identify the key stakeholders at the national level that need to come to work together to start developing this governance bedrock, this governance framework that might lead to better water accounting and allocation. At the moment, we're in phase one, which is the water accounting roadmap. We're building national capacities in water accounting. We're looking at the issues at the national level, that the hotspots in water scarcity, and then trying to develop a plan forward and how we would build a roadmap for national level water accounting. 
Next slide, please. I'll wrap up my little setting the scene with just acknowledging our partners. Um, this is quite a complex program and it requires the cooperation of many partners. We're working with ONWR, technical partners, Australia, Stockholm Environment Institute based in Thailand, and Alluvium and Ampres, which are Australian technical experts with a long history of working on water issues in Australia. What's most important about our program is our cooperation with ONWR and making sure that all of the pieces and all of the plans we put together over the next few years will fit together to help ONWR establish a more cohesive way of managing water scarcity at the national level. And that is not to say we haven't seen the impressive work that Thailand has already undertaken. We have visited many ministries, including ONWR, the Hydrological Institute for Thailand, Hydro, Hydro Informatics Institute of Thailand, where you have an impressive amount of data and an impressive amount of knowledge about the situation of water scarcity in Thailand, and hopefully we can build on those efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Kun Songkiet, uh, this morning some of us in the steering committee heard a summary of the work, but what are you thinking about and what are you hoping this work will provide for Thailand? Thank you. Uh, greetings, Sodika. On uh, part of the ONWR, the cooperation with Australia when it comes to about water accounting and expanding to the plan of water allocation and the creation of uh, prevention of water scarcity. For the plan, in Thailand, we got many agencies when it comes to water resources, about 48 agencies in every season is about the integration of information and create a plan of uh, allocation of water according to season. But the information is all about activities, um, major activities from the consumers, agriculture, uh, ecosystems and industrial sectors, but these are uh, chunks of water that are not in detail at the uh, regional level that uh, we can mention about scarcity at the area or the regional level. But uh, what have happened that when it comes to water accounting in Thailand, we have a feasible study quite a certain extent, such as from the ac academia and universities, when as of now, as a president, it hasn't been applied and utilized to drive a water management um, basis in that is um, uh, concrete as of now. We just create theses and uh, masters at the doctorate level only. But in the past, uh, we did uh, water counting at the Mekong Basin, Bambakong Basin, uh, as uh, Ajahn, Professor Ajahn Manchun has many uh, important works on it. When it comes to water counting, it creates the understanding of water situation. At, in the basin, at, from the primary source, the demand of water, all activities that are in detail at a certain extent. But if we use water accounting and apply it in plan at the water basin level, I do believe that it could improve about water management or improvement of water usage in the basins for what the ONWR expects after this cooperation with Australia, which uh, we have a steering committee, there will be trainings, and uh, trainings on knowledge, understanding on many dimensions and receive technical expertise from Australia. We hope that we can create a plan, uh, water accounting, and the water management in detail than this and expand upon of uh, water scarcity mitigation. Besides water accounting, we also expect that we can expand upon of water productivity, which means that once we have uh, water management, we will know that uh, the uh, water per unit, how much value we can create. For instance, let me give you an example, like one uh, meter square, uh, cubic meter, uh, uh, what kind of products we can produce, manufacture, or the uh, efficiency as, as a two, we hope that we can reach that point. And now the challenges that of this project, there are two parts to it. First is about information and data and uh, the drive, the impetus to make it more concrete. And uh, when it comes to inf data and information, Thailand, we have more 
we have uh, tens of agencies and we accumulate many ways of data accumulation and collection and many databases. This it requires integration of these databases and ONWR, we will be an agency that will integrate this information. And we have our steering committee, uh, will the pilot uh, basin, which is Luman Basak, uh, to uh, succeed. And the second part is about to, to drive to make it more concrete is that uh, there will be part that we have to uh, expand upon from the Basak Basin to other 21 basins waiting. And on part, because our agencies, many agencies of water management, uh, of course, linked to the objectives of the agencies are they prioritized are different. This is a strategy that the ONWR will use water accounting and apply it of the water management at the national level. This is a challenge of the policy from ONWR that we need to drive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun Somkit. It's uh, very good to hear your remarks. Uh, Certainly in Australia, we uh, are operating with water accounting at different levels. So for example, the city I live, cl live closest to, Melbourne. Melbourne water has a very uh, uh, increasingly accurate set of water accounts. The Bureau of Meteorology that Dr. Jaya used to work with provides a, uh, a landscape landscape water balance across the whole country, updated every day. Uh, and we also have, when you mentioned productivity, our Australian Bureau of Statistics, try, it's, the water is not as accurate, but they really try and focus on the value of the water for productive purposes and giving a, a economic quantification. So the things that you are after and Dr. Surasri is after, I think that we can provide a good team to work with you, with FAO, to sort of answer some of these questions, but not academic, move to practical application for city, practical application for basin, bigger picture down the track, practical application for Chalpriya, bigger, bigger picture, practical application for the country, but one step at a time, or two or three steps at a time. Um, before going to the floor, there is also uh, FAO and Australia and Thailand know that there's a few different methods for water accounting that you have seen. So we are making sure that the team in Thailand, the Thailand Australia team, looks at the different methods before deciding which ones to focus on, okay? We can share with you the methods we have chosen, but it will be up to Thailand and Australia FAO cooperation to decide which methods Thailand would like to focus on. Thank you very much uh, to you, Kun Somkit, and to you, Carolyn. Any quick questions from uh, the floor? about the uh, proposed work in this water scarcity and water accounting work. Yes, sir, and can we get you a microphone? Do I have to speak in English or Thai? Put pass Thai can I? Okay, come. <laughs> My name is Warwood from uh, Gasteisa University. Uh, just a moment ago, we heard that Dr. Songkiet mentioned Songkiet. Dr. Songkiet uh, presented about uh, water accounting. Now, when it comes to water accounting, we have been doing this for quite some time. The first set was uh, uh, Professor Egesit. That was the first person, uh, and then Bachar was the second. Like, you know, when water accounting about about a decade ago. We did uh, an intensive efforts with uh, Professor Nushinat uh, from every basin in this, but never mentioned. It was a report about that 10 reports, uh, 10 pages per report of all basins of this nation and used water accounting plus. We use expertise from the Netherlands of water accounting plus. Uh, that was uh, co-created this research. I think uh, this is something, this is the latest uh, information that we have. 
Another issue when it comes to water productivity, I totally agree. And every platform, every state, they always mention about water productivity, but out of person, no one does it. There is no mechanism in place that can drive that anyone who manages water, when you report upon, you have to also report about water production as well. But what is the challenges? What is the barrier? We have to do, uh, do a feasible study. There is a, a, a research in front when, uh, when it comes to water quantity. There's many re reports on it. I also do it too. I have created a web, a web application for one reason. And I, my, my efforts to try to others as well, but we have issues on numbers, pricing and cost. If you don't collect this data, right, so there is no agency that can provide cost estimates. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the agriculture department uh, divisions of whatever, the provincials have it, uh, the nation has it, but these are numbers of like, just for instance, unit production is the same every single year. Like uh, rice production is low. Like last year's data, this year's data is the same. It's like they, they do it. It's like false numbers. But you have to do it, you have to seriously do it, but there must be a direction both in operations and in the field or even the irrigation department. You must read this report as well too. Thank you. National uh, multidisciplinary team. Thank you very much for your uh, sharing of that actual experience. Uh, Kun Somkit, any response, sir? Kapkap. Well, when uh, on this part, our steering group will uh, take your recommendations into account and the review of everything that we have accomplished from the past to the present, we will have to review about the steering committee. The steering committee, we have uh, the technical and academia members uh, to participate as well too. But when the information about water production that at uh, the county level or sub-district level, uh, we will find and discuss how we can acquire such data. But nonetheless, thank you very much for your comments, sir. Please. I would like to uh, ask this question in Thai and add this comment in Thai. Uh, uh, greetings uh, to uh, Professor Warut. Uh, uh, Professor Rota is actually, when I was in my bachelor degrees so as an engineer, he was my professor when it comes to irrigation, believe it or not. When it comes to water counting, I'm really impressed. Last uh, professor mentioned that it's a different dimension what FFO perceives and Thailand perceives when it comes to water accounting that has been presented a moment ago. Nonetheless, if you want to accomplish, put our efforts is a massive challenging for us and for you, for all of us, in fact, because in the Thailand context, it's kind of hard, difficult, but the most important thing, what FAO or Australia, uh, uh, their efforts in water counting, which also perceived to uh, water allocation next, to, uh, to properly manage water, we must all first have proper water counting. So my question is, one thing that I want to be informed, I'll ask, with water accounting that FAO have accomplished or Australia have accomplished or have, the accuracy of water accounting at what is the, at what level? Because in Thailand, when uh, the agriculture sector of farmers, we don't have uh, some, some systems, maybe uh, the price system is easy to measure or uh, the irrigation system is easy to measure the water levels in the agriculture areas will be used. But in the same time in Thailand, many farmers, they actually uh, pump the water themselves and manage the water themselves and use uh, water in different aspects. So this is why there's a big question for me. Water accounting, how accuracy, at what level of accuracy, so that we can utilize it and have proper water allocation that is efficient, the highest efficiency, that, that's where I'm coming from. This is a massive challenge when it comes to water accounting in Thailand. That's my first question. My second question is about water productivity. Water productivity. 
we see in two issues. First, we have uh, collected data, which we'll have to follow an SDG, uh, the, um, the index to measure SDG, water productivity. Water productivity in Thailand is very low, lower than the average of the world when it comes to water productivity. But as of now, what we are interested in is to increase water productivity. We're interested in water efficiency and water allocation, which means how to conserve water because water productivity is the value of productivity of one cubic meter of water can convert to water productivity. So we can conserve this water. It means it converted to water productivity. Second part is about uh, diversification. Diversification is important because Thailand, uh, we are uh, rice paddies, the majority of the activity, right? And the productivity of, um, of the rice paddies requires a lot of water. This wide water productivity is low. There should be a new format, not only on the part of the ONWR efforts only, but there should be in inviting the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Commerce to also integrate and join efforts and to create an outcome to like to create a zoning area of to, uh, to grow, uh, grow agriculture efforts to create value on all these uh, agriculture activities to use uh, decrease and conserve water or use the, the same water levels. So this is why we must to improve or adjust some efforts to see uh, the outcome. So we want to inform the first as of now. What ONWR, what are we interested in and the issues and what are the things that we have to do? It has to be in alignment of those in operations and executions of what we're doing currently. And at the same time, we also have to do some research that should answer the challenges because we have research that will answer the, the challenges of the farmers in execution for the farmers. The farmers won't believe us. Uh, the farmers will continue what they have done before and continue doing so. We could spend the whole day on this and we will not, <laughs> but they're really great questions. I've got some answers as will my friends, but I also have other friends with me and I would just like to invite a reaction from Carleen and from Jaya to parts of uh, Dr. Surasri's uh, comments and questions, if that's okay with you. Thank you, John, and thank you for that uh, incredibly detailed question. Uh, it, it goes to the nub of the challenges that we face to improve our water um, management systems. And the answer to the question from my perspective is you cannot do it all at once, but you have to start somewhere. It is unrealistic to expect that you could put into place water accounting systems that are highly accurate from the get, from the beginning. It is important though to make take the first steps towards water accounting, which may mean not, not as sophisticated measurements, but an estimate of understanding of the water take, and then bring the community and the farmer along on the journey as to why it's important to them that they actually have a water accounting system that will work for them. This, the Australian experience is taking those baby steps first to actually introduce an understanding of why it's important to actually measure how much water you're using, how measuring the water that you're using improves your productivity, so therefore your farm profitability, how measuring water can alleviate disputes between neighbours by understanding who's taking what, and having an approach to water accounting that enables um, a, a starting point where it's at the high level and then you move down to the more technical and more sophisticated level over time will get you to a position where you're able to manage water across different sectors more effectively. You have to start somewhere. The other problem with water accounting is, is that the farming community are less sophisticated, so therefore they're less likely to adopt technologies in water management the way that urban centres will be able to and energy sectors will be able to and industrial sectors will be able to. They will also be able to afford more sophisticated measuring systems. So you can jump into a more sophisticated accounting system in those sectors early on and then move more slowly with your agricultural sectors to bring them along on the journey, remembering 
that about 80% of your water use is going to be in the agriculture sector. So you can't leave them behind because it's too hard, but you must bring them along in the journey. Thank you for that question. There's also a big difference. I just build on what uh, Carleen said. Uh, metering has played a big role in the Australian context. One of the big differences uh, in countries like in Australia and in Thailand is our irrigators are big, they're large, whereas we have small scale farmers all over and you can't measure what everybody use. So maybe you need to think uh, creatively, uh, look at the way that how many uh, hectares do they farm and work out a number like that. But for the, in Australia, even for groundwater, we have mandated and supported uh, and provided the funds through the government, in, especially in uh, Victoria, uh, in Melbourne, uh, where we, we funded the farmers the, to get their meters. So I come back to say the measuring is important. The, the second issue is losses in the system because you get irrigation losses and the poor farmers always feel that they are burdened with the loss because, and, and that's a lot of the canals are earthen canals and the, the turnout structures that you have uh, can, uh, can leak if you are not properly maintained. So in addition to the, uh, the consumptive use, you need to get a feel for the losses and then come up with some strategy as to uh, uh, whether you, in big cases, whether you have to line the canals and how you want to deal with the individual farmers as well. I, I fully support the approach of taking baby steps first and then taking um, more advanced. I have been working in the, the Mekong River Commission, looking at drought, uh, write, writing the drought adaptation guideline at the moment. And even on the Mekong River, for the large storages, when you have a drought, uh, there's no sense of sharing the pain. The ones upstream of the river get a large share of the water and once downstream of the system get what is left behind. So this concept of accounting and making sure that the supply reliability, we talk about supply, demand, but we don't often talk about reliability. And the reliability is a very important aspect because during a drought or when there's shortfall, you can't provide 100% of the water that they always had, but it has to be shared in an equitable way not the people closest to the reservoir, uh, if the irrigation system get 100% and people right at the back uh, get nothing. You know, that is not, uh, not uh, practical. So I think there's a lot of challenges uh, and uh, step by step, I think you'll be able to get there one day. Okay, thank you. So uh, just to round off this section, if, if I may, uh, and again, just final responses to Dr. Surasri for now. <laughs> I think, uh, Dr. Surasri, you're right, big questions. We, with our bulk water supply authorities, we can be quite accurate. Even with our irrigation schemes, increasingly accurate. Um, we can get our landscape water balance okay. We can get our uh, productivity assessments with the Australian Bureau of Statistics okay. Um, again, Melbourne water is getting more accurate. Um, but these, these issues that we are still grappling with, we're happy to, of course, share those with Thai friends because you are dealing with some of the same things. What we know is that you can do water accounting. It's not too hard. Ajahn has started the journey with others in Thailand, and there are different methods. We want to share with you the methods we are using for your consideration and learn what has been working in the Thai context, and that will help us at home, and we hope that what we do will help you a little bit as well. And that's the essence of bilateral cooperation. So it's a great topic. We're glad that you've agreed to work on it with us. We have to keep working on it, and I think you have to keep working on it as well. So let's see where we get in one year's time. Give us one year of cooperation and see how far we've made. Hopefully we've made a few positive next steps. Thank you, Kunsomkit. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we need to move. We move on to our second topic, 
which is focused on river basin committees. Uh, sorry, do I have permission from the floor to move on? Wasn't sure, yep, we move. So uh, river basin committees, that's the topic we've, we've agreed to work on together. And uh, we are going to have some scene setting remarks from Mr. Lerdpunt first, followed by uh, Carleen Maywald, and then let's see where the conversation goes. So please, sir, we look forward to your, your remarks. Thank you, Dr. John, and thank you, um, Ms. Colleen. When, uh, to honorable guests, when it comes to the project about our joint cooperation, uh, the Thailand AWP, one an interesting project is about capacity building on dispute management for rural basin committee. This is about uh, managing disputes and uh, as of today, I would like to present on two main issues. One is about uh, water management in Thailand, so that all of you know at the present of our accomplishments and what tools we have in place. And uh, we will hope that we'll achieve the output of this project. Due, um, relating to the ONWR, is the center agency of integration of water management at the national level, according to the Water Act of 2018. And there are many agencies, about more than 40 agencies, that will be in uh, associate. And there will be complexity about the roles and responsibilities and budget and autonomy. But so the ONWR will be the main authority, a main agency when it comes to water management at the overall picture at the Thailand national level and the objective of water management that will be sustainable. We have four main pillars. Pillar number one is uh, about the act law uh, regulations that will uh, co-use, that will cover uh, all the dimensions. One is about water management, use water usage, development, management, and uh, sustainability and uh, conserve and rights. And in this act, and this uh, piece of legislation, we will have the uh, committee, we have the rights and the power when it comes to mitigate uh, all disputes of water users. Uh, furthermore, we will also create the national water management at the regional level, also give recommendations, protection of uh, disputes, mitigate of all the water in the water basins area. Call number two of importance is about the strategy when it comes to about the 20 year plan. It's about the steer and the direction of water management of the national level under the Water Act. As I mentioned, there are five dimensions. One is about consumption water management. Two is about uh, security when it comes to water protection. Two, three is about flood and uh, disasters with the objective with the efficiency. And of course, the dimension four about conservation as well too. And the mission number five is about the water of management. And one more important pillar is uh, about is the organizations of about national uh, basin level and area level. These are that will drive to the objective. At the national level, we got the national water uh, committee, which we have the ONWR as the secretary and the prime minister as the chair. We will create the policy and direction when it comes to water policies of this nation and dispute water usage of the uh, basin committee. And because the basin level, they have the responsible in managing of the basin, receive disputes and uh, 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 dispute resolution, and uh, we got the uh, water usage to uh, to uh, uh, cooperate as well too. In these three levels, they are in the same uh, as Australia because the Australia has national, we got as state, and you got at the local level. This is uh, what we have heard from the subcommittee meeting. And con uh, pillar number four is about innovation and technology, and that uh, current state status when it comes to the, about the manual of our dispute uh, in Thailand. Uh, ONWR we have created and published when it comes to dispute management guidance and guidelines and consider about all complaints and disputes of water usage. And we created a manual and guidance for the basin committee. This is uh, a, a framework when it comes to managing all disputes of water management. With the intention is about our to preparedness when it comes, if there is any dispute that will occur between uh, basin committees, uh, such as uh, give me a scenario as the fighting over water, water quality, or flooding. What we expect of this uh, project, 
you can see that Thailand, we have mechanisms of water management under about the integrations of cooperation of all uh, parties and this is called the autonomy. And uh, when it comes to disputes of uh, basin committees, Thailand has the revision uh, dispute committee that was created by us, the ONWR. What we expect from this project is that one, it will be about the short, mid, and long term water allocation plan about the pilot. This will be as a guidance uh, when it comes to mediate uh, disputes in the future. And two is about the exchange and learnings of uh, conclusions of mitigation under the Thai cultural context. Let me give you an example about the quality of water at the, the border of Mekong River of the three provinces, Mekong, Lapri, Mekong, which is an issue has been up long pending disputes for a long, long time. We'll have a cooperation when it comes to about individual relationship leaders of our communities to be a mediate this kind of disputes. This is about uh, in execution to solve the, the problem disputes and to have the civil society to understand and uh, uh, answer questions. That's all my presentation. For a super introduction to the challenge and to the project. Um, of course, we're looking forward to working with you on this. What are your sort of thoughts, Carleen? You haven't had a chance uh, to work often with Thai friends. You're getting the chance to sort of engage now. At the beginning of this process, what are some of the things you're thinking about that could be useful for the, uh, the friendship and the bilateral cooperation? Thank you, Thank Carleen. You very much. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, as we can see from that presentation, Thailand is making significant inroads into establishing institutional frameworks that can help sort through the many challenges that uh, face us when we're managing water. Next slide, please. I just thought I'd put this slide up because this shows you the context in which your river basin committees and organisations are working within. On one hand, they're having to consider what are the social and institutional issues when deciding and mediating disputes are important. And on the other side, there's the biophysical issues that will need to be considered. So what's in the interest of the river? What's in the interest of downstream users? What's in the interest of other sectors? On the other side, you've got what is in the interests of the, um, the, the different sectors and how they will impact upon each other. There are many complex um, elements when you're managing water sustainability for economic and environmental sustainability. So the two go hand in hand. And a dispute mechanism system that does not have clear enforceable rules enshrined in law for that dispute mechanism to work within will create a, a, a situation where there will be ad hoc decisions that will not have considered all of the consequences of those decisions. And an example might be where you have a water user group that might be an agriculture water user group that has a dispute with an energy company that's building a hydroelectric plant. There's a significant power imbalance between those two groups. And asking river basin committees to mediate those disputes in the context of one versus the other, without the knowledge and the deep understanding of the consequences of those decisions, can create decision making that will have unintended consequences and could be disastrous for downstream users. So having a system whereby you have enshrined in law a water allocation plan that sets the rules under which those disputes will be mediated is a strength to mitigate disputes. Next slide, please. Because at the moment we have many disputes, but it's only going to get worse. There are so many competing demands for our water resources and our water resources are becoming more stressed and becoming potential for more scarcity and therefore those disputes will accelerate. The irrigation community will be battling against industry that wants to grow 
against energy needs of the nation, which are only going to grow, push towards renewable energies, which means hydro and hydrogen are going to become more important as we move towards net zero. They both require water. Our fisheries will become under pressure as more and more water is taken out of our systems. The mining sector and the mining sector will become increasingly important to meet the needs of our renewable sectors. And those mining uh, interests will also need water. And then of course there is population growth, which demands that people need water first and foremost in the priority of order. So in that hierarchy, the squeeze is going to come fairly and squarely on the irrigation sector. And the irrigation sector is the hardest one to change. So beginning with water accounting and really effective water sharing rules, we can start to put in place a process that enables us to make policy decisions at the national level in the national interest that will guide how disputes will need to be mediated down the track. If we leave it to river basin committees and the processes that are put in place, as the escalation on water demand increases, their job will become really, really hard. Next slide, please. So the challenge for river basin committees to manage the disputes without that kind of framework around it will create great uncertainty into the future. The success of the economic development of any nation is underpinned by its security of the inputs to that economy, and water is a critical one of those. So unless we address the water economics in a sustainably environmental context, we are not going to be able to achieve sustainability in the longer term. Next slide, please. Now there is always going to be disputes when it comes to water. That is the reality. And we can do one of two things. We can actually say this is too hard, so we will avoid having to deal with it. And then it will escalate and future generations will be facing problems that we cannot possibly imagine. Business as usual as an approach towards dispute resolution will only create escalation in those disputes, not only the number of disputes, but the type of disputes that will occur. And all of that will be set in an uncertain water future. Next slide, please. Before you go to that next slide, we'd like to say that that photo is not AI generated. That, that is real kangaroos sorting out disputes. <laughs> and you don't want to get in the way of them. <laughs> All right, and so next slide, please. Just, so there's two processes in the, in the discussions that um, ONWR and I have had over the last couple of days has been dispute resolution is important and having processes in place to manage dispute resolution is really necessary. And certainly Australia stands ready to help where we can. But what we would like to also do is to work on how we can help you from our experiences and the knowledge that we have in water allocation planning to move towards a system that looks at dispute mitigation. So providing the set of rules, the laws and the institutional arrangements that people know what they're dealing with. And so therefore the disputes will be less. Next slide, please. So in statutory water allocation planning, it's not just a plan. It's not, we're planning to go shopping today and we might change our mind and not go. Water allocation planning in Australia is a process we go through to develop a plan that becomes a statutory instrument. It becomes law. That law says how much water can be taken from any catchment. It says how that water is shared between the regions in that catchment and how it is delivered between those regions. It sets in law how water is accounted for. It sets in law how water will be managed during extreme events such as flood or drought. It sets in law how we will manage the quality of water. 
and it enables us to actually understand how much our environment needs to ensure that the take of water out of that system is sustainable. It also sets in law how the dams are managed, how commercial plantations are managed, how mining and floodplain harvesting are managed. And it outlines the risks to the resource and the strategies to address them. These are really critical elements in management of water. And a water allocation plan has two processes associated with it. It's the first step of water accounting. Second step, how do you share that water between users fairly and equitably and enshrine in law their access to that water in a licensed entitlement system? So why do this? So the water allocation, allocation planning system sets the clear enforceable rules. So there is no dispute about the rule, the rule is law. It reduces the risks associated with the sharing of water between users and the ad hoc dispute mechanism which says who should have what. It reduces disputes. We call them conflicts in Australia, but they are disputes. It reduces resources needed for the resolution of those disputes. Because as those disputes become more and more intense and the stakes get higher and higher and higher, the cost associated with mediating those disputes is going to be significant. Water planning also underpins water security, which is really important because it underpins investment in water development. If you don't have water security, the private sector is not going to feel that they can invest in developments where they're uncertain about what the water future looks like. Private investment requires an understanding of the goalposts under which they're operating. And if those are not enshrined in law, and they're left to a dispute mechanism that is uncertain on what the outcome will be, there is less certainty for investment. So investment in economic development requires really good understanding and goalposts set in water planning. And the other thing water planning does is it secures the water availability across the many competing sectors for the national interest not the individual interest, which is critically important. And it puts the decision-making around what the national interest is fairly and squarely with the national government. Thank you. Thanks, Carleen. We've got so many places to go after that conversation. But uh, I think Carleen's just given that, that overview of some things which actually connect some of the dots. We already started at the request of RID, and uh, Dr. Ratmani and RID friends will give an update on that this afternoon. An engagement about water sharing. You know, how the question to us, Carleen, was how do you go about sharing water and requesting water in irrigation systems? That's just one part, you know, as, as you pointed out. And we've already talked about water accounting earlier. But it's just one part as well, but they're important. Um, and you were going to talk about RBCs, but they're still only just one part. And Kunlotban had laid out the bigger picture where RBCs fit in the middle. So this is where we are. In Australia, all citizens, and I'm sure Thailand also, are very interested in water. They want to know, and they want to be involved in, in what happens. And we have no choice, Dr. Surisri, because we expect uh, an increasing drying of our climate in a significant part of our country. So it's not a matter of working out what we do with what we have. We're going to have a little bit less unless we top it up with desal or what have you. So the conversation's very alive. Um, Carleen and Lertban, what do you sort of... Um, What's been most uh, positive for you 
in participating in the Australian water con conversation over the last period of time. I know in Stockholm last year you shared some positive reflections, but what are the things that give you optimism for Australia and Thailand that we can keep working this out? Well, thank you for the question. Um, the optimism or the positive side when it comes to water management in Thailand, uh, due to the fact that we got the ONWR, is about that uh, we co-created water management plans. It could be uh, those about the uh, standards to support the, the seasonal rains, the monsoons, or even the droughts that uh, we cooperate with other agencies to have any contingency plans and lessons learned about the positive and negatives of each uh, mitigation plans of each season and to adjust iterate them uh, for the seasons in the future. Let me give you an example. Uh, the situation as of present, all you know that we are facing the El Nino that's gonna drag on to, uh, to many, many years. So I expect that the mechanisms that are uh, in place uh, designed by the government when it comes to water management of this country, I do believe that it does answer our challenges and uh, alleviate the, the challenges in the future. Uh, then the positive side, the optimism here that we have an agencies that are responsible about uh, creating such policies so agencies can follow and execute. Yes, that's from my side. Um, from my perspective, the conversations I've had over the last couple of days and what I've learned about Thailand over the last couple of months is that there is a really strong national imperative to address these issues. And Thailand is taking a very positive step in having your highest level government officials being in charge of this process. So the prime minister being the person who's leading the National Water Resources Committee demonstrates that Thailand is serious about addressing these issues. I think that's that's a really positive thing and that gives us great optimism that there is the authority within the government for changes to be made. Uh, in Australia, it took our national government to do the same, for our Prime Minister to step in and say, enough is enough, we can't keep doing things in the ad hoc way that we have done them in the past. We need to think of this as a national interest issue and every sector depends on us getting it right. The fact that we are having these conversations gives me great optimism. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, any uh, questions or reactions from uh, the floor, whether it be the front or the back? But we'll start with the front. Thank you, Dr. Surasri. Me again. Thank you. Uh, when it comes in such a situation of a water management, of any dispute management in water, the difference in Thailand, I'm going to share about the difference of, of, of Thailand. So that I share the information as of now, another dimension that uh, you may not have heard before or heard such information, or you may know the irrigation projects uh, creation dams or reservoirs that the state creates or constructs. The objective, when we uh, asked for this project, the objective is about for agricultural use. Agricultural use. This is why after when we develop uh, the country, that's a moment ago that you do did mention about uh, the economic and all the other facets of it. There's also about the land use that has to be changed or the changes of water use as well. But in situations when there's limited source of water, agri um, farmers will demand their rights. Hey, this project was created with the objective for agricultural use, for our use. But as of now, you're gonna change your policy with for industrial use and, and so forth, especially in the Eastern Corridor or the EEC. In this kind of scenarios, when I want to, to leave here, a point is that when you create such a project, 
there is a need, a, 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 a challenge at a certain extent. How can we have civil society, especially the farmers, when they demand the rights to restore these stamps was created for them, for agricultural use? This is why it will probably think about compensation issues, that we should have a fund that will compensate these farmers in these kind of facets or not. It's the question, okay? This has been on the research. This uh, uh, study will find a solution, as you said, to optimize, and there's like the optimism uh, in, in, in fact too, but that uh, this is a important key point when it comes to um, to proceed with this project. So I want to leave this uh, as a point. Thank you. It's a very valid point and it's exactly the circumstance that Australia faces. During drought times, we originally had all of our legislation was around water for irrigation. And when we experienced what we call the millennium drought, for the first time we faced the situation where we had a major capital city about to run out of water. And our water planning processes did not even mention critical human needs <laughs> in the plant. So we were required to set them aside and to renegotiate between the jurisdictions how we would share water and how we would create a, a hierarchy of needs in that circumstance. Because of that crisis, we have now changed the way in which we manage um, water in extreme events. And we have a very clear understanding of the priority of needs and how that will be distributed. We also, are very aware of the fact that this has huge impacts on our irrigation sectors. And we have exactly the same farmer response. Government built these irrigation districts. You must supply us with the water, even if there's no water there to supply. Uh, and it creates a lot of anger and, and, and angst out in our, in our communities. And it's created a, a huge amount of dispute between um, what is uh, urban needs and what is um, uh, irrigation needs. But having the water allocation plan now clearly define at what point and when a trigger is, is um, triggered, this is what happens. When this next drier period emerges at this level, this is what happens, this is what happens. And all of our industry sectors, including our agriculture sector, have been involved in developing that plan deeply. It has taken, it took us seven years to develop the first allocation plan in South Australia. It took us five years to get approval for the basin plan for the Murray-Darling Basin. It takes a long time to work through these processes because you have to engage deeply with all of the communities involved, all of the sectors that are involved, and come up with a plan that you can enshrine in law that people know and are aware of what's gonna happen when and, and understand what the triggers are for different levels of, of water requirement. So we have now a water allocation plan that says in extreme dry um, events, critical human needs comes first. Second comes stock animals. Third comes industry, critical industry and Fourth comes the sharing of the irrigation water. Now the irrigators at first said, that's not fair, we should be equal first. But when you sit down and you go through, do you know what that means? They understand the reasons why that hierarchy of decision-making is important. We enshrine that in law, and whilst they don't like it, they understand it and it is enforceable. And that has created an environment where we can manage those dry periods and distribute water in the national interest rather than in the conflicting sector arguments and disputes that may have occurred that would result in ad hoc decision making and would result in all sorts of unintended consequences. Because if you can't run your water through your hydroelectric powers and cities run out of, of power, that's not in the national interest. How you actually manage irrigators and how irrigators feel about this is a different policy decision. And we manage that through our national disaster 
legislation and policies, and we provide support to our farming communities in circumstances of drought and flood. And that's managed as a disaster relief policy rather than a water allocation policy. Thank you, Carleen and Mr. Lord Fun. So I think uh, two things before we move on. The first one is, uh, Carleen, you spoke of the, well, I'm not sure how many of the Australian friends have yet read the dispute management guidance 1.0, but anyone that's going to be working on this will read it. And so they are informed of your context and maybe through cooperation, we end up helping produce a dis uh, disaster management guidance 2.0. But more importantly, without going back into it now, I think Carleen's point of this other bigger circle, if you like, of the dispute mitigation framework, which is your strategy, which are your institutional arrangements, which are your RBCs. You know, they're part of that. So we'll sort of, we'll try and help you understand our system and we will try and understand your system and then see see where we get very quickly uh. <laughs> the mechanism that you have in place now is the ideal mechanism to start the process of developing the water allocation planning process the water accounting and the water sharing engagement with those levels that you've already established ONWR have done a great job in the way in which they've brought to the table at the range of different levels a structure that will enable this process to work uh, and they're to be commended on that work. I would make one suggestion at the top level. There needs to be more ministries involved at that top level because there are more stakeholders than those that are currently in the National Water Resources Committee. Uh, that need to be engaged in these conversations about how to develop a, a proper water allocation plan. Thank you. And as Kun Songkiet mentioned earlier, we are aware of the many, many Thai agencies that have responsibilities. So it's tricky. Okay. So we've touched upon the water scarcity and the water accounting steps. We've touched upon the capacity building with river basin committees. We have a third topic to share with the, the group. So without further ado, I would share with the group that Australia was invited to sort of think about what we are doing with our early warning systems and have a join a conversation with Thailand uh, with a view to improving the situation in both of our countries. So we have two speakers that will uh, uh, give us some remarks, uh, Dr. Uh, Jaya and then Kun Tanaraj. And I think Dr. Jaya, you have the privilege of going first. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you. Um, I think the first uh, thing that I need to say is that this is a, a long-standing association that I've had in, with Thailand. Because I was first here in 1980 uh, to 82, when I was a student at the Asian Institute of Technology. And then subsequently, I did some work uh, in looking at Kwan Paiao, Nong Han, and Bum Borapet uh, very early. So that's 40 years ago. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to be back again. I've had on and off uh, interactions, but uh, this is a very good opportunity, uh, especially after my work at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, which is the, uh, the topmost authority for all the forecasting of disasters, for disasters and giving early warnings from tsunamis heat waves, uh, droughts to floods. So the focus of, uh, can I have the next first slide please? Uh, so the, uh, the, the key challenges that uh, my conversations with ONWR uh, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Tanraj and his uh, very capable staff uh, has been that they, there is a, <laughs> a request uh, that uh, they would like to see the three to 10 day forecast uh, that they currently provide. Uh, right across Thailand to be improved, and also how uh, we can uh, remodel the uh, the early warnings so that people actually take them seriously and also act on them. Because uh, we in Australia say that our goal in providing forecasts and warnings 
is zero lives lost. I know that it may not be always possible, but even one life lost is one too many. So our target is zero lives lost. So I think if, if we keep that as, as the ultimate goal, we will get there one day, uh, hopefully in Thailand as well. And uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, some of these slides uh, may look quite complicated, but I just want to, uh, uh, at this stage, introduce you to the concept that flood forecasting and warning services itself is a process. It starts with data, it then goes on to get the data to be archived and curated, and then we do a lot of sophisticated modeling, we craft warnings, and then we go to the next step of uh, getting those warnings to the public through the departments of emergencies, so that people actually act on the ground to be safe, and also to make sure that uh, the assets like hospitals, that are critical to a societal uh, a continuity are protected. So it is a process and uh, the way that uh, I have uh, structured my discussions and uh, quite frankly the way that, that, that the ONWR operates with the policies as also with the Operate National Water Command Center is also a similar kind of a structure. So there are similarities in the way that we approach providing early warnings. Next slide please. This slide is not to be uh, read literally, but what, what it shows is that the data acquisition itself is very sophisticated. It's very sophisticated. There, are, there is no one single authority that collects the data. You have satellite imagery, you have rainfall, you have evaporation, you have landscape information, you have uh, uh, other information like stream flow, that's the Royal Irrigation Department here collects. But all of that information needs to be integrated and quality assured because we are dealing when you're early warning with life and death. So we have to have confidence that the data that is provided from a myriad of these organizations are of super quality because in the middle of an event, a flood event, there's no time to be worrying about whether the data is accurate or not. So it is important that there has to be a, a focus area on how we collect that data how we integrate that, how we quality control, and seamlessly use that data into a hydrological and a hydraulic modeling framework. Next slide, please. This is just an example of what is possible and what we currently do in Australia, where we use the observed stream flow and lose, use a, a sophisticated model called ERBS uh, to provide some forecast in over 100 locations right throughout uh, Australia. Now, we also forecast river level heights because a lot of people uh, in the rural areas, like the farming communities, are more familiar with the river heights than the, the, the volume of flow, which is called the discharge, because it is the level that actually influences how much of flooding that occurs. Could I have the next slide, please? So, the way that we are approaching forecasting and also providing information, is we are moving to impact-based forecasting. So when a Bureau of Meteorology provides information to you on the weather, I'll take an easy example. When we say that the wind today in the sea is going to be 100 kilometers per hour, that is what the weather is. And what the weather is, is only information but you can't really act on it because nobody knows whether 100 kilometers, what does that mean? Should I not go fishing today? Is my boat going to overturn? Maybe I can go, but not go too far from the shores. So that is why we have moved from the information base to a more impact-based forecasting. So we have moved from saying what the weather is, which is 100 kilometers, for what the weather does, which means that it's 100 kilometers, so don't go out fishing for the next two days. That's, a, that's a, a very subtle difference, but there is a difference. So that's what it really matters. So in the case of flood, it is the, the flood forecasters as a profession, even in Australia and even in Thailand and around the globe, have always used impact-based forecasting in some sense, where we, we say that the floods could be minor, moderate, major, or even catastrophic. Now that's just a photograph 
uh, of an aerial photograph of an area where you can see the differences between a minor, moderate, and a major flood. And what you should do in order to respond to those floods are quite different rather than just to put out a warning. Next slide, please. Now, one of the differences that we, uh, in my, we've only had a few conversations to date. You know, I've, I've met, uh, been here uh, for the, for, since uh, Monday. So we've had a couple of interactions with ONWR and there has to be, I think, a lot more deeper discussions there as well. We, of course, use an ensemble approach where we look at from today for the next seven days or 10 days, what the rainfall is going to be. And there is no single source of truth there. Now, I work for the Bureau of Meteorology. The Bureau of Meteorology does not think that they have, they know the best. But so we take from global models, uh, such as the ECMWF, but it's a European model. We rely on global forecasts that are provided for rainfall by the US National Weather Services, the Japanese satellite information from Himawari satellite, and we integrate all of that information and use quite sophisticated modeling work to provide future scenarios for the next seven to 10 days. And we use that, what we call an ensemble, means many possibilities to give some probabilistic forecast. Now, what we need to also stress is when you forecast a river level or a stream flow, it is a probabilistic forecast. We can't tell you exactly that it is going to be three meters in that location. We can say that it is going to be three meters plus maybe half a meter, minus half a meter. So the planners who do the evacuations, who do the responses, know what's the limit that they can work with. And the more closer you get to the event, because these updates of these warnings happens in Australia every six hours. In um, Thailand, I think you run twice a day. Some of these models, uh, all 22 basins are not calibrated, but I think uh, 14 basins have been done to date with the modeling work. So they run twice, it's quite an onerous amount of work that needs to be done. But we do some ensemble work uh, in Australia that pro probably we can think about how we do that here as well. Next slide, please. So the, after we craft and do the modeling work, then we have a system of disseminating that information through these days with social media, uh, through our web, through our app, and a lot of other uh, appliances and um, uh, media that we have. But I must say that uh, I was uh, privileged to watch the website, the Thai, Thai water, Dot com, nationalthighwater.com, and I can say that there's a lot that we Australians can learn from that. So it is, it is a mutual, it's a mutual journey. I think we've just started to uh, begun to travel because that website is, is I have seen many in my life through the World Meteorology Organization, and when you combine the information that is in uh, the, the, the the this particular website, and also when you look at the uh, the HII, the Hydromatics Information Institute's website, I think they're tremendously advanced, tremendously advanced. Maybe one area that you could think of in further development is the free downloading of the data, because the data is the, 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 the gold mine here that many use for many purposes is possibly one way that we can start a dialogue, because data is provided free in Australia uh, daily data for anyone to download. Even from Thailand, if you want to download a rainfall or stream flow information on a daily basis in, a, in Melbourne, for example, you can do it. You won't come looking for you with a check, right? So, so it is, we, we believe very strongly the government, national government policy is, uh, sets that very clearly that data is, is, is owned by the public and more people using the data will add value and more intelligence is provided. Next slide, please. I think I've got about two slides left. So another area that we uh, quickly uh, uh, identified is the competency uh, of the capability of the people who are working. We have a quite a, a well-developed uh, competency program. We are in the national equivalent to the National Water Operations Center in Australia. We have in the flood area, we have six specific roles and you can't go and operate a role without having the competencies that allows you to do that. It's not a very complex 
way to get those competencies. Because what happens is when, when uh, there's an accident, somebody drives through a flood, re flooded river and they die, the coroner has an inquiry. And the first thing that he asks is that, did you have competent people working in your national operating uh, office? And how did you measure that they were competent? So we have a very fairly well-developed uh, program that are with separate courses, etc. So there are six operating duty roles, the senior forecaster, uh, what was the lead forecaster, and then others. And they're all competency tested, and they go through a system uh, that is not very, very onerous and not very demanding, but we make sure they're competent to do their work. And we help them to do that work. Next slide, please. And there's a major element of self-assessment. So there are five or six categories that they look at. Um, uh, do I know anything about it? Yes, I know a little bit about it. Uh, I know a lot about it. I have work experience. So these things we will share with uh, our colleagues in, uh, in ONWR, and we'll go through that journey learning about the capabilities, and uh, we, will, uh, we will do that work uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. The last, uh, possibly, the last slide, please. Ah, just one before, one before that, there's a, there's a specific uh, request about the, the, the warnings and how we can craft the warnings. And one of the ways that we've uh, recently done is to bring in the social scientist into uh, amidst ourselves to understand how people respond to warnings. Because in the past, when, uh, when the warnings were provided, we assumed that the public knows how to deal with it. But people... Uh, are, are multifaceted. They have uh, different capabilities, and we have uh, also catered for indigenous communities who speak different languages, who have different levels of education. So we 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 have brought in the social scientists to help us design the way we uh, do the warnings as well. So there's some other areas that I think we can exchange information. Next slide, please. So even in the even in the development of our app. We give a very specific, specific place for the end users, the customers, and we call it user-centric design because we start with the customer and work backwards rather than we tell them what is good for them. So it is very important to understand how our customers look at warnings and how they respond. So that's, that's the, the, I think, the one before the last slide. The next slide, please. The, the next slide. Right. So how is uh, AWP planning to assist um, ONWR? And uh, it is through my current visit. We will be separating the, the, the process of flood warning, uh, national flood warning into various segments, data, modeling, uh, forecasting, and uh, crafting warnings and how the warnings are acted. And we go through a structured process to look at uh, how our colleagues in Thailand are operating. And I will help uh, work with them to benchmark that work with the current best practice in Australia as well as other places and prepare a report with some recommendations so that we can uh, move forward. So that's, that's in a nutshell uh, what we've got planned. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Jaya. I really didn't know you'd studied at AIT, so it's very good that you're able to renew your friendship and cooperation with Thai friends. Please, Kuntana. Yeah. Good morning, my name is Thanarod Vararat Prasawat, the uh, director of HII. You talk about the best practice. Uh, let's get back to Thailand. Now Thailand has changed uh, from uh, the, thanks to the knowledge and experience of Dr. Taya. Now we have the Water Resource Act, BE 2561. And you can see the red portion here in case of crisis or water related crisis. The sector 24 stipulated that uh, if the crisis impacts or impacts living or the uh, items and it can cause damage, the prime minister is authorized to set up the ad hoc command center which can manage the water as of now it's not crisis 
we don't have crisis. That's why we will have the division of water resources. It, in, it, they serve as the secretary to analyze the water situation. So we set up the water administrative center uh, or NWAC uh, with the deputy PM as the director. We also have secretary, uh, which are ONWR and disaster prevention and mitigation division and they will uh, monitor the situation and specify the hotspots maybe uh, the, it is the flood prone areas and what measures we have or what kind of preparation we do we have to do before the crisis then we monitor the the forecast and after the season we will have a lesson learned uh, what we have done so far and, and what we need to improve from what we have done so far. And so it's like the early warning system and we try to improve that and we try to make sure that the people can access that. And in uh, this center consists of many agencies, for example, the Department of Meteo, RID, Oh, and WR related to early warning or the uh, ground department uh, or, or G -O, the department. So they try to uh, finalize or summarize the findings and inform the related agencies for the incidents in the uh, in the area. This center will set up the uh, frontline water management center. It includes the disaster prevention division and uh, ONWR will gather uh, agencies and analyze the water situation to manage it. Uh, maybe how can we drain the water or we can attenuate the water and this can help us in terms of water and stay um, united. And uh, what we need to improve, one more thing, is to promote this among people. And we use the PR department as a part of the team. That's why the media is under their care or responsibility uh, will take care or will distribute the information and um, distribute the information to the public. So we have the television, uh, radio stations, or communicate some community radio stations. We try to uh, inform people about the water situation uh, to make sure that we can reach as many people as possible. We also the situation to the management and we coordinate with uh, we coordinate among agencies um, so this is the assessment process uh, we use the rainfall data and we forecast it. The uh, Department of Meteo forecasts the rainfall. Then we use the knowledge from related party uh, to analyze the potential. Then we come up with the red map, number four, which is the flood risk map. So we can see the risk prone area. Then we inform uh, uh, the related um, ministries, for example, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, and Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperative, because they take care of the crops and manage water. This includes the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. We also, uh, uh, because uh, they take care of, uh, um, and this is the, the example of the announcement we will inform the um, many uh, agencies. Based on our assessment, uh, we still make an announce. We, we, we are still late in terms of announcement because we should inform people or related party at least three days in advance. 
so the related party can have some time to to be prepared and in terms of accuracy we um we inform them the the overview or overall data but it's still accurate but how can we increase the accuracy and can go down to the or um cascade down to the lower level or how can we communicate with the people living in the risk area so we should have the two-way communication and it, it should be communicated back to to the back in well, back office or front office so we can conduct uh, further analysis and the related agencies can prepare for the uh, situation and maybe they uh, so then and, and they will know when the flood will arrive and when we will assume the normal situation so this is what we try to improve and that's why we have a discussion with Australia uh, and, and Australia also uh, recommended that uh, besides our responsibility, they would like to uh, see the end-to-end -end process and they can analyze the uh, work process, then they can fill the gap and uh, provide the recommendations for us to improve the process. So we can make an announcement more efficiently or more accurate, more accurately. So this is what we have discussed between Thailand and Australia. Thank you, sir. Sirs? Time's fairly short. We're really uh, heading towards lunchtime. And, uh, but if there are urgent uh, questions from the floor, please, Dr. Surasri. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, from the expectations when it comes to about accuracy of the early warning systems. This you know, of vital essence and importance, as you have mentioned, that there should be zero loss of life. That is our end goal and ultimate goal. So I want to ask the Australian model when windy application, the, um, is that correct? I have been following this app, the windy app for the duration of the DOM. My question, in the processes of early warning systems in Australia, after the warning has been issued uh, during the time, is there any plans of uh, adjustment of progress? Because DOM about the direction of a storm or hurricane may have changed, right? But these kind of issues, uh, the Australian government, uh, does the Australian government, how do we inform the citizens to adjust and adapt to the changing circumstances and situations or any uh, application uh, warnings that for civil society and the citizens can follow up on themselves. I think this is, this is important because early warning system in Thailand for the ONWR, uh, we are still lacking this uh, particular format, especially like per, uh, Typhoon, for instance, right? Uh, in the preliminary stages, I looked and studied in every model from the Japanese, from Hong Kong, or ECM, WF uh, from uh, Europe, or even uh, the Australian model too. It's different from Thailand at a certain extent, because Thailand, we always uh, reconsider and forecast of a direction of a, a, a hurricane, um, a typhoon, for instance, so that we can calculate the expected rise of water levels in the reservoirs and dams. And this is part about plays a role in about how we manage water, right? Early warning systems plays an important role, but in fact, it is quite inaccurate, right? There's some offsets right, uh, significantly 
so we expected uh, like about 1,400 million of, uh, meter sorry right expected and then said hey no that's not right look at australian uh the app and the warning that the, the, the storm is heading to australia not to thailand right so this way like go back again and they're uh, about uh expect about 800 million uh, meter squares of water expected to come to the dam so uh, after the storm has passed see the impact of the dam in the end is about 600 million uh, cubic meters which is the steps the the the, the disparate dispensary is it's massive right so this kind of impact right in this kind of influence we did a warning preliminary but there are maybe some changes of the wind direction possibly or about the atmospheric pressure for instance that uh, impacted the direction of the, the storm heading to Thailand. These kind of stages that I, I sh uh, give as an example, does the Australian government have any updates to the population and assistance and how long does it take for all updates? But uh, this uh, study that we are about to commence in this joint partnership, this is an uh, important facet that should be considered. Uh, thank you for that. I'm very impressed that you're actually looking at the, uh, like ECMWF. You know, I mean, you just just rolled out of your tongue quite easily. Where I, would, I wouldn't have expected <laughs> that at all, because that's the European Centre for uh, uh, National Weather Forecasting. You know, um, so to answer your question, I can just focus on the flood and this the flood forecast after you give. It's a it's a continuum. It it, it, it continuously gets updated. So you provide an early warning, let's say three hours in, uh, sorry, three days in advance, like a flood watch. And you don't do anything except that uh, the government mechanisms now know that certain areas have higher risk than the others. But then as, as uh, the, 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 the days get closer, you start to update even at intervals of six hours. So every six hours for a flood, we'll put out a new forecast. And then we work very similar to Thailand. We have the disaster prevention and mitigation department here, I think, who is responsible to uh, evacuate people or get them to build sandbag or do whatever the mitigation process. So in, in Australia, it is a federated system. So we have all the states. Each of the states has an emergency separate emergency uh, authority that is responsible through legislation to act. So we provide the general information uh, and there is some coordination. If it's really a, uh, gets into a crisis situation, there's the national government gets involved, but there's an escalation process. Now, I think I have only just touched on the, the, the flood as an aspect. And then, uh, John, probably there is um, uh, some some uh, uh, opportunity here to discuss that. I think you uh, were speaking about a much more broader sense in the early warning system, also querying about not only flood, but also uh, cyclones, uh, tsunamis, heat waves, the forest fires, and all sorts of other uh, droughts, you know, all sorts of other, uh, uh, you know, natural disasters, and how you respond. I think the, the, the bureaus uh, treats the tropical cyclones quite differently than the way that it treats the flooding because tropical cyclones uh, has a track and the track has a probabilistic uh, distance. What is important is where it hits the land and that town is the one that's got to be so the accuracy gets uh, more and more uh, than the error band narrows when it gets close and close to the shores. So we have a, a, almost a continuous modeling group through the national operations that will continue to do those modeling work to continually informed through form. The formal, the formal warnings for floods are provided every six hours updates, but informally, the equivalent to the Department of uh, Disaster Mitigation and uh, Control here, uh, talk to us all the time. And during the flood, we, we, during non-flood periods, we have our staff from our flood operating team going and spending three months, sometimes working in the department 
and getting the department people to come and work inside the bureau so we know the difficulties that we face and the demands so from both sides we exchange staff etc so the, the to summarize the answer we do much more sophisticated modeling and update every six hours and not only every six hours is the formal warning but informally we continue to talk especially if a river is going up and there is a levee bank that is built to prevent overtopping and if it is getting close nobody is going to wait for the next three hours to get the information we continually talk to them and they talk to us and say what is your best estimate is it going to overtop should we start to is it too dangerous now that maybe we should start to evacuate early so that's a that's an organic relationship that will dynamically develop as time goes by. Thank you, Dr. Jaya, and thank you, uh, Kuntanalot. I think we're, we're going to invite you for lunch with Dr. Jaya. Um, colleagues, if I let this run on any longer, I'll be in trouble. Um, it is the duty of the uh, moderator to try and get people concluded. Um, so I would just like to uh, say, with thanks to all of the people on my left and right, uh, we have dealt, well, we have opened up the conversation about water scarcity and accounting. Those that wish to follow up in more detail, please try and have lunch with our colleagues here. We have also opened up the conversation about river basin committees, not just dispute resolution, but also the, the larger context of dispute mitigation. We've opened up the partnership conversation about early warning information systems. So they are three new areas of cooperation that on the Australian side we really look forward to taking forward. We're going to break for lunch and then after lunch, if you uh, remember your program, we're going to be reflecting upon the state of play in some existing cooperations and also hearing how that work is going. So um, please enjoy your lunch. Please be back at 1.05 for a, uh, a uh, commencement. And uh, could I please invite everybody to uh, thank our guests on the stage. <laughs> Thank you, the moderator and panelist. On this occasion, I'd like every I'd like to invite everyone to have lunch in the duck cafe on the same floor or on this floor, and please take the lunch coupon in front of the room. Go ahead. Before like breaking before lunch, I would like to have uh, um, resuming the commencement. It begin at thirteen o five in the same room. Please return on time.